Hey there. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Matty. I get to be one of the pastors here at Epiphany Station. And I get to walk us into our next conversation from our teaching series, which is Begin Again. But before I do, allow me to tell you a little bit about the two things that we do at Epiphany Station. One of the things that we do is our worship experience gatherings. We host these almost every single week, currently on a Sunday morning, and the goal of them is to give a place for people who call God their God, who want to love God and love people, to come and to worship and to celebrate and to hear God's word taught and to be challenged and to implement it. It's a chance for us to use some of our spiritual gifts together as a larger group of people gets together. But Sunday morning gatherings, worship experiences, they are actually not the point. Uh, They are not the pinnacle, not the apex. They're not why we exist. Instead, there's something else that we do. The other thing that we do is called church families. Now, church families for us is church. Church families is where church happens. Church families are smaller groups of people where we can actually know each other and actually be known. Smaller groups of people that meet not in a large cavernous building, but meet in people's homes and read God's word together and pray for each other and share burdens and actually live like they love each other. And the reason I share this with you is because church families is something that we choose to put effort into and to create, but it's just an environment where some of the good things can happen if we desire it to happen. If you are not a part of one of our church families, we will unashamedly, unabashedly tell you that's where we want you to be. Now, maybe you've got a great biblical community somewhere else, nothing wrong with that. If you've got what we're talking about and being the church, that's phenomenal. If you don't, that's why at Epiphany we create church families. And we talk about this now because of what we're going to talk about next. The goal of this teaching series, Begin Again is built on the understanding that as human beings, it is our tendency to give up, to let things slide, to lower the bar, to ditch. And we're likely to do that in a few things. Uh, We're likely to do that by just giving up on who God's created us to be and allowing some lesser version to live out 80 years. We have the tendency to give up on God, to not allow him to take the place in our lives that he should and that he deserves. We struggle to not give up on really good things, hard things to do that are the very best thing that God has called us to. And for our conversation today, we have a tendency to give up on people. Our experience and what we have experienced of people is that people can be the worst. People can be very difficult in family, friendship, or strangers. They can be very hard to love, And few and far between are we loved by them. And yet, God has said that the reason that we are here is to love God and to love people. So even though loving people is hard, it is not something that we can throw to the wayside. In fact, Jesus said when he was asked, what's the two most important commandments of the entire, well, he's asked the most important command of the entire Bible. He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And equally as important is to love people as you love yourself. Because of that, sometimes within the church, we come with this understanding that, okay, so we love God because God's actually a little bit easier to love because he can't do me any wrong and that's great. So I get to love God, but I have to love people. And therefore we come to it with a lesser version of not really love, but begrudging Tolerance. We put up with people. And therefore, church culture is oftentimes this very surfacey, very nice version of community. But it's not actually what we were created for. And so my goal for this conversation is to help us reframe, not that we have to love people, but that we get to love people. We get to love people. We were created to do it. And God sets it out in front of us as a thing that he desires of us. And that we get to be a part of what he has always been doing. His existence, his choice is to love people. And to follow in his footsteps would be to do the same thing. No matter how hard it is. Now when you talk about loving people, you can talk about uh, intimate relationships. You can talk about husbands and wives, children, parents. You can talk about friendships. You can talk about church. All of a sudden you start to reminisce those periods of time in which you've had super close good friendships and relationships. And other times that you haven't. 
Uh, my wife and I were talking the other day. We moved up here about 14 years ago. And we moved up here kind of like in the midst of some chaos. Like I just left my country. Um, I didn't leave it for any noble purposes like fleeing religious per- uh, persecution or anything. I just left it because I wanted better tasting food. And I married my wife. And she just, we just uh, finished, she just left college. And so we got moved up here to Thief River, seemingly by accident, but actually on purpose. And then we landed here and we didn't really know anyone. Like we didn't have close relationships. Jackie's got some family up here. Um, She's an Engelstad, that's her maiden name. And so they're everywhere. But we knew some. We knew some aunts, some uncles, uh, grandpa, some cousins. And that's, that's all, that's all we knew. We kind of got into the thick and we started to work and we started to find a place to live and we started living our lives. And the thing we were talking about the other day was that it was probably a good three years before we would say we had friends. Three years to find friends in a new place. Why was that? Was it because we didn't try very hard? I could be blamed with that. I'm not the kind of guy to knock on your door and say, can we be friends? So maybe we just didn't go after it that hard that much. Is it also that, you know, good friends are hard to find? This is Northwest Minnesota. Good people tend to hide in the bushes so you don't know where they are. Good people usually have good friends already, and so they're not on the lookout either. Uh, it's also sometimes an instance in which you start to develop a friendship, and it's an acquaintance, and it's getting there, and then they leave. Check this out. Some people uh, live up here for a while, then look around, and it dawns on them that they don't want to live here for the rest of their lives. Can you believe it? Nonsense. And so they leave, and then, okay, so that friendship was a false starter. And then you start to realize that once you do have friends, it's really hard to have friends because they're not self-sustaining. There's something you have to invest in. It's something you have to put time and energy into. And beyond that, having real, close, deep, trusted Like this kind of like improving each other, dependent upon each other friendship, that's so uncommon. It's almost unnatural to human behavior. And so it's hard to maintain. It's hard to find. It's hard to keep going with it. It's easier to quit. It's easier for us just to be okay with all our relationships being on the surface. At least it feels easier allow the marriage to just be as as good as it's currently going to be, or just raise the kids, they'll be out of the door soon, we don't have to try too hard with that one, or friendships, I see people at work, I, I say hello at church, it's not a problem that just we have. I uh, looked up some research, it was by the American Survey Center, um, and for those who like charts and graphs, take a picture and you can check it out later, but here's what it shows. It shows that people will self-report that in 1990, only 3% of people did not have a close friend. Fast forward to 2021, and that has quadrupled to 12% of people will self-report they do not have one single close friend. Look on the other side of it, and you see in 1990 that 63% of people will share that they have four or more close friends. That number shrinks down in 2021 to only 38%. Like this is a common cultural thing that seems to be happening amongst us that we are not drawing closer together and forming closer relationships, but we are actually distancing ourselves. Why is that? What is to blame? Is it that with too much entertainment, too much TV and internet, is it that we've just become such insufferable jerks that we can't stand each other? Is it that we don't have time? Is it that we're too busy? Or is it that we just maybe have forgotten that to have a really good relationship actually asks quite a lot of us? It's actually quite hard to do. And once you've forgotten that, once it becomes hard to do, it's so much easier to just give up, to quit. This can't be right. This shouldn't be hard. Counterintuitively and countercultural would be, no, good relationships are hard. They're hard work, but they're worth it. They're worth the investment to have interwoven, mutually dependent people that you know, and they know you. Why is it so important? Why does it have so much value? Because God says it does. One of the definitive moments in Jesus' ministry was when he was coming towards the end of his life and when he started to declare, I am going to leave you, so I need you to listen to my last words very, very, very attentively. 
And he gave a command to his people based on the last three years of life with them. This is what he said in John 13. He said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. What he's saying to them in this moment is, everything you've experienced of how I've treated you, that's real love. That's actual love. And I know you've all got this other version and idea of what it could be and what it's been lesser, but that's what actual love is. And that is going to become the definitive. It's going to become the hallmark of my people. That those who I have been with, those who within I reside, they're actually going to love. That's going to be the only proof. It's not how much money we throw around. It's not how well we dress. It's not how much we smile. It's how well we love other human beings that will be the proof that Jesus Christ has been with us. That he is who we choose to follow. And so he gives this command and says, not only that, but you're going to love the way that I have loved. You're going to do the things that I have done. That's what we're going to bring to the rest of this world. That's what's going to change anything is how people love people. So here's what I want to do with the rest of our time. I want to walk you through, um, it's, it's a reasonable sized chunk from a letter that was written to the church that helps us understand what this could look like and what is asked of us and what needs to be done to both start it, maintain it, and to see it continue. We're going to look in the book of Galatians, which is a letter written to the church, to us, so that we'd understand who we are and what we're to do. If you don't have a Bible that you understand, out on the info desk is a stack of free Bibles. One of them is exactly for you as a free gift from us to you, so you would be able to start reading what God has wanted you to know. For those who currently are Bible readers or are going to get started, I want you focused in on this week, Galatians chapter 6. In church families, I want you reading it. I want you meditating on it. I want you seeing if what we are commanded to do and be as the church, as people who say we love each other, are we actually doing that? I'm going to get us started off by reading this swath of Galatians 6, verse 1 through 10. Track with me, and then we'll, go some, we'll do some walk back through. This is what it says to us. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You're not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Now there's a lot in there and there's a lot of action, engagement, interactive words in which we are called up to do and be something towards each other. So I've highlighted them for you. Let me walk you back through them. It says that we should gently and humbly help, be careful, share each other's burdens, help someone. Pay careful attention, be responsible for your own con conduct, share all good things, harvest and plant. That we would not get tired of doing what is good, that we should do good to everyone, especially to those who are in the family of faith. This is very call to action kind of hmm, imposition upon those who say they love people, that we would actually love people. Here's the breakdown that we would become people that take responsibility for ourselves, that we would work super hard and gain satisfaction from that work so we're not always spending our lives just in comparison to others, 
that we would be a people ready and available for the love and help of others. We would not count ourselves so important that we would choose only to carry our own burdens, but we would actually choose to share in the burdens of others and be available to help them when they need it. And that we would be a people who do not give up. And that we would consistently make the most of every opportunity to do good to people and to do good to the people within the family of faith. Now, you say all these things, you're like, hey, be good to people or be excellent to each other for those who were raised in the 90s and do that consistently. And everyone's like, well, yeah, of course. Of course, let's just continue to do that. Why wouldn't we? Well, it's easy enough to say one thing, but then harder to do it. And so the action of this becomes most difficult because it's not natural to us. It's not the way that the world has taught you to live. For however much life you have, one to eight decades, you have been passively or actively taught instead, take care of number one. Look out for yourself. Maybe by extension that your nuclear family, that is the most important people in the world. You've been told not to help other people because they don't deserve it. You've been told not to ask for help because then you're vulnerable to show that you're in need. Now we live in a culture that also seeks to teach, don't be responsible for your own conduct. Don't take responsibility for your own actions. You can just let it go and someone else will pick up the slack. So we've got these messages being pinged at us from left and right saying, don't worry about loving people. That's not what you're here for. Just be suspicious of them. Just stay divided, stay polarized, stay unforgiving, stay unhelpful, and just keep your head down and trudge forward. All the things about our lives tend towards this. Work that doesn't leave room, kids that have a lot of need, money, finances, individualized entertainment, all of these breed this idea that all we can do is what's right in front of us. We don't have anything else to give or to receive. Let's just hunker it down. And this, as we see from scripture, can't be right, it can't be good. Even if we call it fine and normal, it's not right, is it? We actually instead are hungering and thirsting for something greater than this. We actually desire to be loved, not by one, not just by God, but by people. And we are gifted, created, to be able to give that to others, to love other people in varying degrees and varying places. And so what he asks of us is that we would choose that above anything else. We would choose that these active words from Galatians would be active words to us. That we should. That we should do these things. That we should bring glory to God by how we love each other. If we can admit that these things are out of whack, that to love people is going to require something different, then we admit that something needs to change. What I want to share with you are four things that I believe I see both in scripture and in practice, that ask something of us that is required for us to have a God-honoring, loving relationship with another human being. At the root of all this comes our first conversation that we had in the teaching series that good does not come from us, good comes from God. And when we allow him to use us for good, then other people can be recipients of it. So this is by no means the four magical steps to you getting friends. Yet it is something that I feel like maybe we've neglected in understanding what it requires of us to be in close relationship. Here's the first thing I think we need that we're not super good at. Cadence. Now, cadence is usually a word that's only used in response to uh, military the troops as they march. Someone yells out, calls out, cadence. It's a rhythm for them to be in step to or to be running to, to keep them moving as one. And the world you live in is almost anti-cadence and more pro-chaos. That we don't have rhythms, that we don't have patterns that we are in that other people can come alongside us with. We enjoy such fierce individualism that it's actually quite hard for other people to come into our lives and stick with us. And yet one of the fundamental commands given to the church as it was being established in Hebrews 10.25 it says, let us not neglect meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. 
I believe that we need in our relationships, any relationships from spousal to parenting to church, there's gotta be some rhythm. There's gotta be some cadence because they're not self-sustaining. And what's most naturally to happen is things just to fall into entropy and decay. If we don't put it on the calendar, if we don't make it happen. Jesus said, you're gonna love each other as I have loved you. Well, Jesus had a cadence with his people a cadence to take meals, a cadence for prayer, a cadence of doing ministry together. Also that they knew where he would be and knew where they would be with him as they followed him. He says, you need this. You need a place where you can be around similar people, loving God and loving people for you to be able to give of your spiritual fruit and receive from them in regular habit and pattern. If we're not careful, we slide into I'll see you later. I'll see you later, which works for most relationships because I'll just generally see you later. But for those who you're gonna love differently, it can't be that. I I don't think we can wait for some time to crop up on the calendar to go on a date with our spouses. I don't think hopefully snatching a few hours here and there of distracted time with our children is sufficient for raising our children. And I don't think friendship happens when it says, I'll see you this summer. Oh, we'll do that thing next winter. I think it needs regular, steady cadence. One of the things about church family as it was unveiled to us from God was that they get together on a cadence. It's talking about weekly. We're talking about time carved out of the calendar. We are going to see each other. I will see you next Friday. I will see you the one after that and the one after that and the one after that. And you start building a rhythm together. The second thing I think we need that some are super good at and they know they're good at it and some that aren't good at it don't realize they're not good at it. Presence. And that's because people like me think we're being present and we're not being present. I've been humbled over the last 15 or so years of relationship to my wife to be regularly reminded that to be with her means I should actually be with her. I should actually be able to look her in the eye hear what she says, and when tested, repeat back to her what she said. And you can only wing that a few times before they start to realize what you're doing. Presence is essential. And it's not just, oh, you should be present. We need to be present for a larger and more important reason to actually have investment into the other person's life. Hear again what Galatians said to us. It said, share each other's burdens. In this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Too much when we're in relation with people, there's something in the back of our heads that says what we want to do is a little bit more important than being present. That, and sometimes it's something ridiculous, like scrolling things on the phone. Or maybe I just don't have time to be with you because I want to do this. No, that's, that's not a loving relationship. A loving relationship is I will be there with you because there's going to be times and places where they need you to share the burden that they carry. And if you can't be there with them and show them their value with your time and your energy, how could they ever hope to share a burden with you? And the almost humiliating thing the human beings struggle with is the realization that one day I am going to be in need to share a burden with another. And I need them to be there for me. And if all my example of being there for people has been distracted, distant, not actually there, how could I expect them to be there for me? Over the last couple of years, especially in uh, discipleship relationships and in counseling relationships, I have heard over and over and over again, my spouse's phone gets more attention than I do. When we look at church families, as Pete and I go over them, the ones that don't continue, the ones that kind of shrivel are those that people show up, they read the questions, and they go. The ones that thrive are the ones that come together and ask questions of each other. How are you? Now, let me ask you again, like, really, like, how are you really? After the first answer of, oh, I'm fine. But how are you? How is your walk with Jesus Christ? 
do you have any unrepentant sin? Is there anything we need to get into? They're actually choosing to focus on each other as a worship of God, loving him and loving people. We need this rhythm and cadence. We need to be there. And I believe something that is far too easily missed today, we need to offer permanence. I think sometimes we think that people know we're not going anywhere. I found out after a few years of marriage that my wife was still quite sure that I was ready to leave. At any moment, the drop of a hat, as soon as she became too much of a burden, that I was going to ditch and abandon her as she had experienced in the past. And had I been doing anything to prove her otherwise, other than just kind of being there? No. I learned that you have to say, and I'm not going anywhere. Yes, we've had an argument, and I'm not going anywhere. Yes, we haven't had time to connect recently, and I'm not going anywhere. I grew up not making very many close, intimate um, attachments to people. Not in my family, not in my friendships. So when I left my country after being there for 23 years, I didn't shed a tear. And I thought that was fine until I realized what actual relationships look like, that we should miss each other. When someone leaves, we should weep because it was so good that we'll actually miss it. And if we don't miss anything that we're leaving or that has left us, did we actually have anything? And so we speak permanence into these relationships that we're going to be here for each other and we're not going to ditch just because it gets hard. Galatians 6, 9, and 10 says this. It says, let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Not good... Nothing good comes just by happenstance. It is due to the decision and the investment of people that want it to be good. And I believe that being there for people is a spiritual discipline often neglected by myself, by us. Something that requires priority, that I am here and I'm not going anywhere. And the last one, The last one I think might be the hardest one for Northwest Minnesotans. So unless you moved to the area recently, this one might actually twist the heart a little bit. Substance. Substance becomes the grist for the mill. Actually of having something beyond paper thin underneath the surface So that when those moments come where cadence is difficult and presence is hard and even permanence looks shaky, you have a connection with someone that goes beyond, did you watch the Vikings? That goes beyond, it's cold outside, isn't it? That goes beyond, I'll see you at church on Sunday. Here's where in Galatians we see a level of required substance that does not come easy to any human being, does not come naturally to us. It says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. You want to talk about substantial relationship? It's those who deal with things that are important to God. And one of those things is dealing with sin. And if we don't have people who we know if they see us in sin or they hear us in sin, that they will come and say something to us, I worry for us. We are called by God to live these God-honoring, holy lives that we will do imperfectly until we go home. So he says, you know what you're going to need? You're going to need another pair of eyes. You're going to need other people around you who love you enough that when everything else in them says, just stuff it, just sweep it, just leave it, it's not that big a deal, they will step up and say, I'm concerned that you're walking in sin. I'm, I'm concerned that you're dishonoring God. Or even harder, you have sinned against me. I'm not against people getting together for trivia night and game night and trips to go eat meals. Nothing wrong with these. But something is severely lacking if we never talk about the things that matter to the Lord. If we never talk about him with the people that we say we're in relationship. 
We never talk about his ministry to us, how he saved us. We never talk about what he's doing next, how he's transforming us. And if we never talk about our sin, if we never share or ask to have a burden shared, if we never bring it up or we never own up to it, if we never celebrate the relationship of what it is, if we never say the the great fruit that we see in each other, if we never encourage one another in the giftings that God's called us to, if we never celebrate the fact that I see you're struggling to follow Jesus, but the fact that you're struggling and you're trying and you're wrestling, I love that. We are deeply in need of people who will encourage us to continue to walk the path that is righteous, that brings God great glory. We need substance. We need something in that relationship that is far more than just me and you. It's me and you with him. And so this is the great call on the church. Now more than ever, when we find our Western culture slipping into individualism, turning away from interwoven communities of faith, it's for us to reinvigorate. It's it's not our parents, it's not our children, it's us. We are the ones uniquely positioned right now to be countercultural and to do what others have not done or might not do, to reinvigorate old relationships that have gone cold, to reignite relationships that are dead, to start relationships based on a foundation that this is what a loving relationship is and anything less, I don't really want that. I don't want to settle for that. I don't want to be okay with that. Now, you can't have this kind of relationship with everyone. Don't get into your minds like, hey, and you should love everyone in this room the same way. Pete and I joke frequently whenever we hear anyone from a stage, like at a concert, our pastor says, I love you all. And Pete and I are like, no, you don't. How how could you? What kind of an anemic, weak love would that be if I said, I love you all to the greatest extent you'll ever be loved? That's awful. No, you can love a small group of people, though. You can love those that God has put in your, in your life. With a reciprocity where you're both going after this, love to your parents, love to your children, to your spouse, to those who you are walking this life with, we can have that. Do not allow yourself to give up on that. Choose who you're going to love. Don't let it happen by happenstance. Say, these are the people. As you sit there right now, what names rattle around in your mind? Who? Who has God put in your life for you to do the most beautiful ministry that's ever existed? To love them. Who has he put in front of you for you to be able to display Christ-like, sacrificial, deep, I'm here for you kind of love? I think each of us has someone and each of us is on the mind of someone else. And it would take us to do this for each to be loved and each to be loving. My second question is this, in the four things that I just brought up, where are you strong? Are you a great lover of cadence? Like that's your jam, like you love to see things, like we're doing this regularly, we're doing it consistently. So if we're married or if we're a family or for a church family, I'm gonna be the one that says, let's get it on the calendar and let's do it and let's see it through and let's be consistent and be there. Then bring that passion and strength to your church family, your family, your marriage, your your kids, anything. And don't be ashamed of asking for it. It is a strength of people that a lot of people are weak in. We just say, we're gonna do this and we're gonna keep doing it. Maybe for you, you put that great value in presence. And maybe you felt that weakening in your relationship. Have the courage to ask for something greater. And say, can we, can we be here together right now? Can we, we put all the distraction away? Can we put everything to one side and just be me and you or us? Can we actually talk and listen? Can we, can we hear one another and actually show a value to one another that you're worth my time? Maybe for you, it's about that permanence. You're a steady person, you're a stayer. You're not going anywhere and you actually want to create a group of people that also aren't going anywhere unless God says different. But maybe it's for you in your marriage to say, you know what, it's been hard and it's been shaky, I'm not going anywhere. Kids grow up, they kinda get rebellious. I mean, mine, not yours, yours are perf. But they get difficult 
And there are times in which they maybe even think you're just ready to ditch them. Maybe you have a conversation saying, no, I'm your mom, I'm your dad, I'm not going anywhere. And in church families, when cadence has been difficult and when things have felt distant, maybe you just say, we're not going anywhere. We're here for each other. And finally, maybe you, maybe you're the one, and it's a rare individual, but maybe, maybe for you, it's all about that substance. It is all about the depth. It's all about that, hey, let's, let's unpackage some sin tonight and deal with it. Let's, let's not have chit chat. Let's actually talk about the things that are meaningful to the Lord. And don't be afraid to put your hand up and say that. Many people want that to happen, but they don't know how to say, can we go a little bit deeper together? Maybe you're the one that is going to say that in the marriage, the one who's preparing to be married. Maybe you're the one who's going to say, hey, maybe we don't just feed our kids. Maybe we train them up in the Lord. And maybe we don't just get together once a week as a church family. Let's invest in a ministry together. Let's pray together. Let's seek healing for someone together. And you bring substance to the relationship. No matter who you are, each of you is bringing strength to relationship. That's how you're gifted That's how God creates such a diverse group of people to come together. Our similarity is that we want to love God and love people. So we would choose to invest and sow so that we and others would harvest from the work. I've been here for 14 years now. The only thing I regret about investing into relationships is that I didn't do it earlier and don't do it nearly enough. But I have wept with men. I have shared my burden with them. And I have received theirs. I have sought to be a good friend, and my goodness, have men been good friends to me. I do not regret the time that has been placed into this beautiful thing that's supposed to be where we genuinely love each other. If you don't have that, we're not telling you we have the magic answer. But we created church families really for that end. That we would create environments where it can happen where you can bring to the table this idea of having loving relationships with people in God's family. If you're not in that and you desire that, let us know via your program, connection card at the info desk, or message Pete and I directly, and we will work hard to find a place for you to call home. Maybe this actually just like ignites your heart. Like this actually buzzes inside of you as, oh, This is the most important thing. This is why I exist. You want to bring this to everyone, everyone to have this. That might be because God has given you the heart of a church family pastor. That you, no matter who you are, would be prepared, trained, prayed over, commissioned, and supported to pastor and love other people to provide this kind of environment. Let us know in the same way. We can start the slow and steady process of preparing you for such a thing. When Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing in the world? Why are people even here? He said to love God and to love people. And by loving people, we bring God great glory and we evangelize the world. We show a people who only know how to hate each other, only know how to do surface level, what actual loving relationships look like. And by that, we fulfill our purpose for being here. So in a second here, I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to pray for you that God would develop a hunger in us for this, that actually loving people and not giving up on this would be who we become. I'm going to pray that you are given opportunities, either in a church family or outside of that, in some other form of church family, organic, grown, godly community, where you get to bring that and to receive that. And then I'm going to pray for you to take action, for you to take a step that shows that you want something different in your marriage, at home, in your church, where we would not become complacent and okay with something that is far less, and that you take personal responsibility, not to wait for some other person to come and gift it to you, but you would take the step to be a part of creating it. I want to read for us again what it was that Jesus said in John 13 as he told people that he was leaving, as he told them what was most important, he made sure that they understood why he'd come and what they were to do next. So he said, now I'm giving you this new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. I charge us as a church 
to prove to the world that we are his disciples. Let me pray for us. Father God, I ask and pray that your word as, as we hear it would be the great encouragement that it is that the opportunity for us is that we could have everything that you have promised us and we could do what you have asked of us. That we are well within uh, our... We are in our sweet spot when we're doing what you tell us to do. When we obey and we're empowered by your spirit to do it. So get us in this sweet spot of loving people that we would not settle for anything less than your desire. Help us to be a people where Christian marriage means something, Christian parenting means something, and the church, for all of her foibles and difficulties, actually it means something to us. And it means something to the rest of the world that's looking for something substantial and meaningful. God, I ask you to put names in our heads of people for us to love to choose to love, to be intentional about loving. God, would you move us out of here not being able to shirk it or not being able to slide it away, but to be the church that you've called us to be that loves you deeply with every fiber and out of that then really does love people incredibly well. We ask this for our good, for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.